to introduce myself, I'm Christopher Rufo. Uh, I'm a writer, I'm a documentary filmmaker, uh, and I'm probably best known, however, to audiences at MSNBC and the New York Times as a liar, a racist, and a propagandist. Um, yeah. And what I've been doing the last year has really been uh, battling on the issue of critical race theory. Um, it's something that about a year ago, uh, approximately rounding down 0% of Americans had heard about critical race theory, really limited to people within the academy, people with specialized knowledge. And over the course of the last year, working with just a few of us, two, three people at the beginning, uh, according to The Economist and other polls, we've now educated more than 150 million American adults about critical race theory uh, and tipped the scale so that they oppose it by somewhere between a 20 and 40% margin. And I'd like to open my remarks with uh, a quote inspired by Senator Hawley last night. Uh, when you have a United States Senator quoting Marcuse, you know things have gone horribly wrong, but they're going in the right direction. Um, Marcuse wrote in an unpublished essay on cultural revolution, we think in about 1970, uh, that quote, the most outstanding feature of today's radicalism is the subversion not only of the established economic and political structure, but also and even primarily of the entire established culture. Sound familiar? Yeah. Uh, this cultural revolution ac accentuates its total rupture with the cultural tradition, tradition and assumes the character of a cultural revolution, which is to prepare the ground for the coming socialist revolution. And I think it's really encouraging a lot of you in this audience, a lot of you in this crowd, a lot of you in, in, in media and journalism uh, are starting to understand that the fight of today is no longer along the axis of economics, but primarily along the multiple axes of culture, race, gender, identity, et cetera. And my small point that I'd like to make and substantiate today and then provide some, some suggestions on is that our critique must take this cultural revolution seriously, uh, literally in some ways. Uh, it's not a kind of revolution, Marcuse even wrote, um, that the old way of revolution, the working class revolution, seizing control of government buildings and you know, TV antennas uh, was, was unworkable in the conditions of modern capitalism. Uh, but through a process of subversion, through a process of steadily deteriorating the culture, uh, you could essentially get a, get a country or a culture to submit over time. And because I'm familiar with it, I'd like to share some of my own work on critical race theory uh, and perhaps as a guiding uh, example or model of what uh, even some of you in this audience uh, could do. As I mentioned, it was two or three of us a, a, a year ago. Um, a, uh, a friend of mine, James Lindsay, uh, other folks that had been kind of around the edges of the critical theories trying to understand exactly what was happening. But otherwise, a lot of these issues were unexamined, uh, unexamined certainly by conservatives um, who had, had been uh, uh, lamenting them, but in a superficial way understanding that this ideology was prominent in academia, starting to understand that it was developing prominence or even dominance in K through 12 education, uh, and obviously some of our larger media institutions. And so what I did uh, was set about conceptualizing what was happening, um, not from a purely intellectual frame, but actually trying to understand what it looks like on the ground. Uh, what does this look like within our institutions? Uh, how does it treat people? Uh, and started this, this journey over a course of a year of doing a series of reports uh, on critical race theory in American life, and specifically America's public institutions and then even corporations. And so my strategy, my, my plan, which was kind of happened by circumstance at first, was to uh, try to understand it uh, from a framework of intellect, try to expose it in reality, doing reports on more than a dozen schools, uh, 10 corporations, more than a dozen federal agencies, uh, and then creating a vocabulary for people. And I think oftentimes conservatives, if you talk to people uh, out in the grassroots, out in the real world, outside of the, the kind of intellectual sphere, uh, they have the intuitive sense of what's happening. They see what's happening to their kids. Uh, they understand, for example, uh, when their kids are being divided, uh, asked to deconstruct their racial and sexual identities and then rank themselves according to their power and privilege. Something that's happening in public schools starting in kindergarten, documented. Um, they understand something is wrong, but they don't understand how to articulate it. It's an intuitive feeling uh, 
It's a violation of their moral conscience. And what we can do, as many of us in this audience, intellectuals can do, is provide a moral vocabulary and provide a, an intellectual framework through which they can understand these issues, they can conceptualize and then articulate them back to the institutions that in many cases are doing harm, uh, even abusing their kids. In a captive environment, many families have no choice but to attend a K-12 school that is assigned to them by zip code. And over time, this, this question for me, it started with a question, what is it? How does it express itself? Developed into a body of evidence. I now have, as a, as a journalist, a, a, source, uh, uh, a, a source book of more than 5,000 sources in every kind of institution in the United States saying that we're being told uh, uh, to, to confess our white privilege, our white fragility, our internalized white supremacy, or being told that our, their kids are, are going to be forever victims and oppressed, have no possibility and no agency. Uh, starting at the very youngest age, um, Arizona Department of Education, for one quick example, uh, was teaching uh, its schools that children become racist by three to six months old and that the duty of the education system is to purge them of their racism before they become full-fledged racists by the age of five. It's ridiculous, I mean, it, it sounds ridiculous, but this is a, a, a common notion in many school districts across the country. The goal is not competence. The goal is not the transmission of knowledge. God forbid the goal is not the, 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 the guide towards excellence. Um, it is to play with the psychology of race and politics and push that onto kids at younger and younger ages. I have two kids. Um, I can say confidently, uh, I don't think that kids, I've seen them play all the time, uh, I think it's just patently absurd to any normal person that kids three, four, five years old uh, could be racists. And yet our elite institutions are hammering home this message every day, and it's become the conventional wisdom in many school districts across the country. And so what I did is was set out really to embarrass these people, uh, to, to pin up their documents, always with hard evidence, hard reporting, documentation, to expose it and then to drive attention towards it. Uh, these stories started doing 10 and then 20 million media impressions per story, developing a body of evidence that I think was in part uh, responsible for this unexpected and totally organic grassroots uprising of parents at school districts saying, enough is enough. I want you to teach reading, writing, math, and the essential skills that's gonna get, that, are gonna, that are going to get my kids ahead. I don't want you indoctrinating them in your left-wing political ideology. And so we've seen average people in more than 1,000 school districts across the country uh, in a state of revolt because they've understood something that was the intention of people like Marcuse and the critical theorists, which, to, which was to undergo a march through the institutions and then use the public institutions uh, funnel this elite uh, ideology through them and then impose them on the recalcitrant and uncooperative middle Americans uh, who they lamented were not only non-revolutionary but were anti-revolutionary. Uh, they flipped it on its head. They said, as, as Senator Hawley alluded to, uh, not just uh, white radicals but white radicals making an alliance uh, with the oppressed using the image, using the uh, the moral uh, authenticity or the moral claims of the oppressed as fodder for their own ideological program. My contention is that that's exactly what we've seen. In the federal government, I reported on dozens of agencies, even during the Trump administration, which was ostensibly hostile to these kind of ideologies. Um, for example, the Treasury Department uh, telling employees, more than 10,000 employees, that the United States was a fundamentally racist country. Uh, that was founded on white supremacy, slavery, and exploitation. And only by dismantling the United States and all of its institutions could this situation be improved. The Treasury Department. Um, and so on and so forth throughout our institutions. And I think that the work that I've done that has elevated this issue uh, from zero to now a, a, a really dominant issue uh, in, our, in our discourse is because people are hungry for understanding. People are hungry for real knowledge, and people are tired of being lied to. Uh, there is a manipulation that people use. They have uh, high, high credentials. They have uh, great pedigrees. Uh, 
Uh, they speak in beautiful multisyllabic language. They invent their own nonsensical words in order to intimidate normal people in suburbs, in small towns, in cities that don't feel equipped to fight back. And I think part of our task here is for all of us to arm the average American, to arm the man and woman with two kids, two jobs, a mortgage, a car payment, with the vocabulary, the knowledge, and the courage to start fighting back. Because when we can unleash this power, as we've seen in school boards, we utterly confuse our opponents. Um, we, we send them into a convulsion of, of confusion and denial and uh, all sorts of conflicting emotions, where we've seen people at simultaneously trying to make the argument since the summer that critical race theory doesn't exist. It's a myth produced by Chris Rufo and his henchmen. Um, and at the same time arguing that critical race theory is essential to teach in K-12 schools. There's nothing more important. And I think what we've seen now, even in the state of Virginia, anyone been following that? Yeah. Glenn Youngkin, a great campaigner, great candidate, was, was down in the polls pretty significantly. Around the beginning of September made critical race theory the central focus and the closing argument of his campaign. And then all of a sudden, over the course of these two months, critical race theory, or education rather, has gone to the number one issue. And among those voters who consider education their number one issue, he's seen in two months a swing of 42 points, including many Biden voters who are saying, you know what, I didn't like Trump at all, but what's happening in our schools is not right. What's happening in our schools is not going to help my kids. And what's happening in our schools is a violation of my fundamental right to be involved in my kids' education and to shape the, the moral development of my own children. And so what I think this has done, for, first and foremost, perhaps, is exposed the entirely fake and artificial nature of this cultural revolution. Gramsci, another one who I heard referenced last night, which I think is just fantastic, um, he predicted the rise of so-called organic intellectuals, uh, this fiction that somehow the ideology of subversion, the ideology of Marxism, neo-Marxism, uh, would arise spontaneously in the people. But what we've seen, and I think what I've exposed, is the brittle and fragile nature of this movement uh, that is not organic in any sense of the word, but state-backed and elite-driven uh, politics that has no support among the actual American public. And so what do we do about it? Uh, what are the lessons of this past year? Um, I would say, again, that if we accept seriously the conditions of cultural revolution, uh, which I think is, is, is undeniable at this point, we must fight, conceptualize our own fight on those same terms uh, as a counter-revolution. Um, if you're trying to reform or you're trying to issue a corporate tax cut or you're trying to appeal to uh, uh, the the strategies and tactics of 40 years ago, you're not even playing on the actual battlefield. You're playing in a illusory and artificial battlefield that hovers somewhere above the real change that's happening and the real interest and emotional engagement of our actual constituents of the people in this country. And I think our goal, as we should think about it, um, and as I think about it every day, I live in a small town in Washington State, about 10,000 people. Um, middle class, uh, thankfully not many people in media or journalism and academia, uh, which keeps me sane on the weekends. Um, the goal is to protect these people, to protect middle Americans of all racial backgrounds, working class, middle class, to protect them against what I think is a hostile and nihilistic elite that is seeking to impose its values onto the working and middle classes to bolster their own power, prestige, status, and achievement. But unlike the left in the 1960s, with, which after the implosion of the radical movements, after the implosion of their uh, uh, urban guerrilla tactics, you know, a lot of people forget, at least my age, maybe never knew, between 1970 and 1972, there were two, more than two or 3,000 politically motivated bombings in the United States, more than one a day. 
which led to the collapse of this moment that was resurrected in what they called, what Marcuse and Rudy Duchka and others called, the long march to the institutions. And I think for us, conservatives um, might be tempted to replicate that strategy, but I would caution against it. I think that the strategy of our own long march to the institutions is destined to fail. I would suggest an alternative strategy that is uh, placed to our strengths, that is adapted to our times of laying siege to the institutions. Exposing them for their corruption, exposing them for their waste, exposing them for their hostility to the values of the vast majority of the American people. And in the work that I've done in the reporting, I've seen what I think is the Achilles heel of this cultural revolution. We like to think of this in abstract terms, in intellectual terms, as some kind of ideology that is popular amongst maybe college students and their boomer professors. Um, that is somehow in the culture. Politics is downstream from culture. Um, maybe, I don't think so. In this case, I think it's actually, uh, politics is downstream from state institutions. If you look at the history of critical theory and then its spawn of critical race theory, critical gender theory, critical whiteness theory, one of my favorites, um, it's entirely a creature of the state. It was born and nurtured and raised within publicly financed and publicly subsidized universities. And it now survives only in this vast constellation of publicly supported and public su publicly subsidized bureaucracies. It's morphed itself in this, in this really insidious and false language of diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's kind of the softened and marketing-friendly version of the critical theories. And then embedded it itself in these public positions that in theory are designed to serve the public, uh, but in practice only serve their own private political interests. And although we could say they have great power, I think, I think without a doubt it's the dominant ideology in the federal agencies, it's the dominant ideology in the public universities, it's the dominant ideology in the public K-12 system. It also gives us a tremendous opportunity um, because what the public giveth, the public can taketh away. That's how our system works. And I think we've been too timid. We act as if this is, that we act as if the status quo uh, is something that we should accept. We act as if this cultural revolution uh, is something that we should tolerate in public life. Uh, but it's a choice that we've made and it's a choice that we can unmake. And I would offer just some brief and uh, uh, tentative suggestions for policymakers to think a bit more aggressively. Uh, how do you want to solve this problem? How do you want to start to chip away at the influence of these critical theories that are doing uh, damage uh, to our country uh, and damage to our kids? First, in K-12 schools, I think what we've done and legislatures have done over the last uh, short time is, is just ban the practice of critical race pedagogies in K through 12 schools in now 10 states covering 75 million people to basically say if you're teaching that a racial group is fundamentally oppressive or racist or fragile or guilty of a historical crime we don't want you teaching that in our public institutions. I think this however is a temporary fix and the larger fix in a system that is failing so many kids is to provide every American family with a fundamental right to exit. Okay, there we go. I reported on some schools in Buffalo and in Philadelphia, for example, that by the end of middle school have an 80% functional illiteracy rate. Only two out of 10 kids can read and write at any level by the time they graduate seventh or eighth grade. Um, and yet they're pumping them full of ideology, uh, telling them, for example, in Buffalo that, quote, uh, all white people perpetuate systemic racism, and that, uh, quote, racist police could shoot them and gun them down and kill them at any time. Uh, simultaneously excusing their own failures as a public institution and shifting the blame onto these outside forces while failing to provide the most basic prerequisite of a successful life in an information society. 
Every parent in that school district and in every other one, if the public school is failing to educate, if the public school is, fa is violating their sense of conscience, if the public school is forcing kids to confess crime simply because of the way they were born, every parent should have a right to take those dollars and move them to any school of their choice. And in this way, you fight not directly. We should never fight directly. It's very hard. Uh, you get a lot of pushback. We should fight indirectly, more, in a more sophisticated way, to start slowly chipping away at these bureaucracies and institutional powers. The universities, even more difficult terrain. But I would like to remind you that while 90% of schools are in the, 90% of K through 12 students are in the public schools, something we don't forget, we almost don't even know, is that 90% of university students are in public universities. It's dominated by the state in an equivalent way to our K through 12 system, and therefore is subject to the regulation, subject to the good governance, and subject to the legislative powers of our states and our federal government. And while we've bloated the bureaucracy of our universities with these full-time administrative positions that push this ideology, that start to regulate even the most subtle and fine psychological uh, uh, expressions of its students to in ensure ideological compliance, um, it's a choice that we've made. We funded these things as a public, and it's something that we can take a serious look at as the student loan bubble starts to look like a Ponzi scheme, uh, as these bureaucracies prove unsustainable, and as they're saddling American kids with $100,000, $200,000, in debt by the age of 22 or 23. Um, this is a situation that works for nobody but the full-time, six-figure ideologues that masquerade as microaggression investigators and diversity and inclusion officers, uh, and in what the Soviet Union they at least very much uh, more honestly called uh, political commissars, which I think is the analogy here. And finally, the third institution I think we can have a, an impact on is the federal bureaucracy. In theory, as the framers laid out, the federal agencies uh, were responsive to whom? Anyone know? Do we still remember? The people, but the president, right? And, and you know, during my research, unfortunately, I saw that even during the Trump administration, the federal agencies were distributing hundreds of millions of dollars to left-wing activist organizations, sometimes explicitly activist nonprofit organizations, and sometimes covertly uh, academic projects, bureaucratic projects, school projects uh, that, were, that were something that Marcuse could have only dreamed of implementing that the federal government under a conservative president was directly financing. So the next time we have a conservative president in office, on day one we should issue an executive order freezing financing to left-wing activists and ideological projects. And then freezing this tremendous corruption where the agencies hire their friends, uh, including people like uh, uh, Janetta Cole and Howard Ross, who the Treasury Department hired. Uh, this gentleman, Howard Ross, has billed the federal government millions of dollars for things like a half million dollar power and privilege sexual orientation workshop at NASA. Um, I guess the astronauts were exploring themselves uh, up in outer space. Um, I'm not sure what they were doing. Or Janetta Cole, a, a former fellow traveler with the Communist Party USA, that were paid during the Trump administration to lecture Treasury employees uh, that they were fundamentally racist in, under the Trump administration. We have to end the gravy train of the consultant grift and immediately start hammering down with a forensic audit of all direct financing to contractors and grant recipients run them all through the Office of Management and Budget, and then perhaps if there's a staffing shortage, those things get slow walked and strangled for four or eight years. And to close, because they asked me to speak for an extra five minutes, um, I think more than anything what I've felt this past year is that the grassroots anti-critical race theory uprising that we've seen all over this country is what I think of as a proof of life. Uh, the American people are saying uh, that we still have the instinct for self-government. Uh, 
The American people are saying we still care about what happens in our communities, in our institutions, and we're willing to fight for them. But they need guidance, they need leadership, they need a vocabulary, they need information. And that's what we can do in this room. The efforts of just a few of us, two or three people, a year ago, have now created a permanent nightmare for MSNBC um, and the New York Times, uh, which doesn't know how to handle it. But we've also exposed a nihilistic elite class that has been operating with no pushback and no scrutiny for 50 years. And so what I would suggest to all of you is using this small example, this small campaign that we've done uh, as a model. And as we know that the cultural revolution fights on multiple axes, uh, we should replicate this model on every axis of the cultural revolution, meet them on their own terms, and defeat them. And I think ultimately, if you look at critical theory and the critical theorists, um, they really thought that what would eventually happen, this is kind of the permanently delayed ambition of the whole movement, dating back 150 years, is that eventually, through elite agitation and their ideological materials, um, you would have a, a revolt uh, against the capitalist class, the oppressors along race, class, gender, et cetera, uh, but what we've seen is just the opposite. Uh, we right now have a, a great American revolt against American institutions that no longer serve American interests. Uh, and this power is out there. It's something I see every day when I go around this country. Uh, and I think it provides us a tremendous opportunity uh, to not only defeat them, to not only lay siege to their institutions, to not only force them to be productive citizens and not rely on uh, the permanent employment for their private activism, subsidized in full part by taxpayers, but to actually then compare it with a new set of values, to get schools oriented towards excellence again, towards achievement, towards uh, great citizenship. And I think we have, uh, uh, in a conditions of a revolution of values, where they're trying to tear everything down, we have an opportunity to raise people's sights upward. And I think when I think of the things that drive me emotionally, that drive these families emotionally, that, you know, they're struggling. They have kids, they have bills, they have things, and they're still showing up to that school board meeting. Because something deep in their hearts is saying this is important. We have to excavate those values. We have to articulate those values. And we have to fight relentlessly towards, for those values until we win. Thank you so much.